Welcome to Support Life, a program focusing on current social issues from a life-affirming perspective. I'm Gavin Bolch and my guest is Dawn Stefanovic, the author of Out From Under, The Impact of Homosexual Parenting. Dawn, welcome to Australia. Thank you, Gavin. Canada is home for you. Yes. Okay. Been here how many days now? Oh, my goodness. I have to count. Oh, my goodness. It's about a week, just over a week right now. Okay. Yes. And the wonder of coming to Australia is it's pretty much like Canada, right? It is. Australia is beautiful. Uh -huh. Beautiful people, beautiful country. Reminds me of home. Mm, it does. Mm. I've been there and it's the closest to Australia that I think exists. Yes. So that's good. Yes. All right. Now, you're out here for a very important reason. Yes. Define that reason. I am uh, out here to share about what the impact of same-sex marriage does once it's legalized. And we've seen that in Canada in the last 10 years. And it's truly 1984. Hmm. Okay. You were born in Canada. Yes. Okay. I was born in Toronto, Canada. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in a homosexual household. And uh, it was a very difficult experience for me. Enough to now write a book, perhaps? Yes, but I didn't have plans of writing a book when I was a child. Okay. Or a young adult. Yes. I had no idea. Okay, because we're just um, maturing, understanding what's occurring to us. Yes. What's been imposed upon us. Yes. As a child, you thought like a child, right? Right. And now you've matured and you understand much. Yes. Do you want to go a little bit back into your childhood? I can, yes. Um, I was sexually abused as a baby and then sexually molested growing up. And uh, by the time I'm 10 months old, my father has brought a partner to live in our home for the first five, five and a half years. So we're talking about two males here? A male partner? Yes. So there's a male partner in the home. And he's teaching me my alphabet and numbers uh, by the time I'm about three years old. And I'm also experiencing nightmares that would last for about seven years. And I have a major speech impediment as I begin to speak. Okay, so looking back on that, would you call that the outworking of the trauma that you were engaged in? Yes, it had to do with my environment, what I was exposed to, what had been done to me, and the fact that I didn't see women being loved and valued and seen as important. So my budding femininity and womanhood, even as a little girl, was not being affirmed by my father because he wasn't showing that love mm -hmm. to woman, my mother. Well, that's interesting. So let's move quickly to teenage years. Yes. How did that show itself, well, that it's, lack of love? You know, I, I started to look at boyfriends trying to, th you know, I was thinking they would fulfill that need inside, and they didn't. But, you know, I didn't know that at the time, and I wasn't talking about having grown up in a homosexual household, having been exposed to the developing cosmopolitan uh, gay village in Toronto, Canada, and all the sites that I was exposed to in that environment. Mm. And the fact that I had been taken to Canada's first sex shop, Lovecraft. My father had shown me um, all the different for, uh, paraphernalia and different things in that shop. And he didn't want me to have a narrow view of sexuality or gender identity. He also took me to Canada's um, well-known um, Gay Nude Beach, which is just off Toronto Island at Hanlon's Point. And so he gave me uh, exposure to a fair bit. And there were different partners that would come and visit in the home. And so it was that was my experience. Mm. As I was coming into my teen years, I noticed that uh, I was angry. I was angry. I couldn't express my feelings or my thoughts. And I was afraid of hurting my father's feelings. Now, that's a very interesting element of real love, mm -hmm. okay? Here's a relationship, a parental relationship. You loved your dad and didn't want to hurt his feelings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What happened? Well, I 
didn't use a name for what I was experiencing, but I did have uh, some understanding of my environment not being a normal, natural environment to grow up in. So it was not something I wanted to share with anyone at school. Mm -hmm. I was afraid to bring uh, young men into, into the home as friends because my father had actually made advances towards a minor a friend of mine that had come into the home. And uh, so it was, it was not mm -hmm. safe to bring my friends home. Okay, so that limits the breadth of friendship that you were engaged with? Yes. With both sexes? Oh, I, I didn't want to bring anyone home yes. if, if I could avoid it. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, childhood was colourful and informative, but um, not very conducive to a strong moral core being developed? Yes, yes. Um, so I grew up, you know, my idea of sexuality and gender identity was what my father was presenting to me. Mm -hmm. And it was a sense that everything was boundless. Now that wasn't reality. That wasn't true. But I still had to go through that struggle myself personally and uh, take on that impact. And I did not have the words to describe mm -hmm. my feelings and my thoughts until um, as I got to my late 20s, early 30s. All right. Now that change in vocabulary or richness of vocabulary yes. to help explain yourself or yes. what you'd experienced. Yes. Where did that come from? How was that formed? You know, it's interesting because you try to deny the impact when you're growing up in this and you, you try to ignore it. And you, if people were to ask and when they find out, you try to minimize the impact. You do everything. And there's this false idea that somehow when you enter your 20s that you know just getting an education and a career underway and possibly a good relationship it might take away the painful void inside and it didn't I, I came to this place that I had to face the reality of what I'd grown up in and you put all the mangled mess out on the table and really look at it well let's come back to this void Yes. And uh, how we filled it. Yes. You're watching Support Life and we'll be back after the break. <music> Welcome back to Support Life. I'm Gavin Bolch and my guest is Dawn Stefanovich, the author of Out From Under, The Impact of Homosexual Parenting. Dawn, we were talking about a void that the lifestyle that you observed and uh, experienced to some degree as it was imposed on you just left this hole, this vacuum. What began to fill it? Well, you know, I tried to fill it with boyfriends and, you know, I could have several at a, at a time and, but somehow it, it just, it wasn't working. Um, you know, I thought that if I had received some kind of love or attention it would fill that void that my dad had not been able to fill. Mm. And it, it didn't work. I couldn't substitute for the real thing. I, you know, I really, really needed my dad to affirm me in that area. And the boyfriends couldn't mm -hmm. compensate for the loss. Now, this is an interesting spin on the word reality. Yes. That there was yes. something innate inside that said, I'm not affirmed by my dad. Yes. I'm neglected, I'm not wanted, I have no purpose. Hmm. What else did you put in that void, that hole? You know, sometimes I'd study, you know, to spend time studying. And, you know, I went to concerts and movies, just like all the rest of the kids. And I didn't get too involved in parties. It wasn't, uh, you know, I didn't have this overly exciting life. Mm -hmm. I think my, my, my dad would come in the home at times with different partners. And when I was, especially when I was in my early teens, there was something that was very eventful to me. I didn't understand. And uh, my father had come home on the weekend and mentioned that... Uh, there was something the doctors had found in his blood and they didn't have a name for it. And I was afraid for the first time that my dad was going to die. Mm -hmm. 
mm. and I didn't want him to die. I didn't want to lose my dad, even though I hurt inside and I had this very significant void inside. I really wanted his affirmation, and I was really afraid that I was going to miss mm. out on that. Okay, so we're saying that there's something about the human condition, the DNA, where um, the girl misses her dad, looks for the affirmation, uh, and if that's not there, then trouble is a brewing. Yes, yes. All right. What about um, other forms of formation as you come to understand who you were and why the troubles came? What about spiritual formation? Does that play a part? It does, yes. You know, I'd had um, a very interesting dream when I was about eight years of age, and I was walking up a crossroad to the top of the T. And as I was walking up, there was this figure to the right of me that was speaking to my heart, and the lips weren't moving. And I had this realization that this was um, God in some form speaking to me. And he was asking me to follow him. Mm. And as I said yes in my heart, he immediately pointed out the right way for me to go. And I turned right at that crossroad. And as I was walking down that crossroad, it was dark, pitch dark. And all around me was dark. And as I looked at my feet, it was like a lamp was shining on my feet. And a little bit of light, a few steps out from my feet, was on my path. The path was gravelly. It wasn't nicely, smoothly mm -hmm. paved. It was very rough. It wasn't an easy road I was going to be walking on ahead of me. And at the, in a great distance I had down that road was a cave with, looked like a rock that was moved to the side a bit and bright light was shining out, out of that cave. Now, that's a very sort of metaphoric, animated sort of dream. Yes. Okay. I'm an eight-year-old child. Which a child understands. Yes. So can I say maybe you've read some of C.S. Lewis's stuff? I hadn't read C.S. Lewis. I was very challenged when it came to reading and writing at that time in my life. Mm -hmm. And so to me it was a word picture being communicated to my heart. So the trauma of early childhood, which yes. left you mute. Yes. And um, words didn't play a part, but the pictorial world did. Yes. Okay. Yes. I think a lot of our viewers would identify with that. And certainly we live in an age now where it's storytelling. We live out of a screen. We spend time on a screen, don't we? Yes. Whatever age we are. Yes. So we've moved into this wordless visual age. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's at eight years of age. What else uh, was in this picture that was being formed for the rest of your life? There was a, a special sense about what love is and what love isn't. And there's a separation happening between the real and the unreal in my life. But isn't, don't we hear people just say, well, you know, um, so long as we love this other person, whether it's same sex or whatever, it's love. We use love so mm -hmm. frequently. Uh, you're saying, now just hold on a minute, unpackage this. So help me yes. unpackage love. Love is not a selfish thing. It's a very, um, very, it's more than emotion. It's more than attraction. It's love that goes beyond ourselves for the benefit to help others make a difference in the world around us. Mm -hmm. It's a very sacrificial type of love. It's a love that costs you a lot. And uh, so the kind of love I had for, uh, for my dad was there even though he hadn't affirmed me. And he, he represented some kind of God figure to me and I didn't realize that at the time. And it was even in my 20s I was still, de uh, still desiring his love, his affirmation. I hadn't yet received that. And it was uh, 
the day before he died, I was uh, I had come to his place and I was waiting. His last partner had uh, made arrangements and just pumped my father full of morphine because he was in a severe amount of pain. And I went over to my father who looked like a skeleton at that point. His knees were bent and his eyes were sunken and closed. And his breathing uh, was very subtle, but you could see the rising and falling of his chest. Mm. And I asked him, I said, Dad, can I hold your hands? And he said, yes. And, uh, you know, I was holding back tears at this time. And I heard him say, is this my daughter? Tell her I love her. Thank you for that. You've been watching Support Life and we'll be back after the break. Welcome back to Support Life. I'm Gavin Bolch and with me is now Dawn Stefanovic, the author of Out From Under, The Impact of Homosexual Parenting. We just heard the most amazing words from your dad. Yes. Is this my daughter? And yes. he says? Tell her I love her. Yes. You've been brought out to Australia by the Australian um, Marriage Alliance and the Australian Family Association. And you're here to talk about that love, informed yes. love. Yes. Tell us a little more about that. Well, I grew up under the GLBT, LGBT umbrella. And I have only compassion and love for people who struggle with their sexuality and gender identity. And it's this tiny little fraction of power elite that are using the legalization of same-sex marriage in Canada to bring in a level of state control that is truly Orwellian and very scary, very sinister. And I'm, I don't want that to happen in Australia. How many years has this movement been um, happening in Canada? What would you... When was the starting point? Well, Same-sex marriage was legalized in Canada in July 2005. And with that, unknown to most Canadians, it redefined parenting from natural biological parent to now just gender neutral legal parent, which meant that the state could come in and usurp the authority of parents. Okay. Now, you experienced that without the legislation in your own personal life, that there is something beyond legislation, the, the, the natural state of the, the boy, the girl, the child. Yes, yes. Leans towards mum and dad, a man yes. and a woman. Yeah, a child needs to know and be raised in relationship with their married father and mother who are biologically related to them, if at all possible. Every area of brokenness has to be acknowledged. Anytime we separate a child from either their biological mother or biological father, there's a painful void that's there. And it can only be filled by our biological parents. And we need that connection to our ancestry, our heritage. It's very important to our own sense of identity and security. And so when a country goes and changes the definition of marriage, they're breaking apart the very basic institution that is the foundation of society. And when you do that, it puts in play where the state now, no matter what freedoms have been promised to you, the freedom of speech, the freedom of religion, freedom of association, freedom of assembly, your conscience rights, your freedom of the press, your freedom to participate in the public sphere, all becomes restricted mm -hmm. under state control. And people don't realize that, but you need to look to Canada. We have hate tribunals at the federal level and at the provincial and territorial level where all speech is policed 
We have anti-bullying and safe school policies in our schools, which are teaching our teachers and administrators through sensitivity training how to look for bullying. It also teaches our children how to police the speech of each other in the classroom mm -hmm. and the playground. And when I say bullying, because the human rights commissions, the hate tribunals, have as protected categories sexual orientation as a protected category, and in some places gender identity as a protected category, what that means is that the speech of children is being policed in our schools. And because parents are now just legal parents to be equal with each one of my father's sexual partners. Now at that level, the state can usurp parental rights because being a parent as legal parent means the state can grant you legal parent and the state can remove your legal parent. So now children can be accessed by the state without uh, parents' approval. And that's why we have uh, in our schools things being taught we disagree with, uh, our values, our beliefs, our religious beliefs, our political opinions are now uh, being policed. And if we are opposed to the government laws around marriage and gender, um, we are called before a hate tribunal. And just on the complaint of an activist who says, I have hurt feelings. They get their legal fees paid for. We have to pay tens of thousands of dollars to defend ourselves. With, um, at the federal level, we had for over 30 years a 100% conviction rate. And in our provinces, it's a very high conviction rate. And if truth is not a defense, research is not a defense, and neither is your religious beliefs. So religious beliefs are not protected. It's out the window. Sexual rights trump religious freedoms. Mm -hmm. Okay. What is the one thing that you would like to say to our watching audience? I would say hold on to marriage, which is a covenant between a man and a woman for life to the exclusion of all others. Your freedoms are at stake. Don't buy the lies that you're hearing. Don't move into a place where, where you will be unequally protected in law. Dawn, thank you for that very sobering account of your life and what our lives could be. You've been watching Support Life and that's all for our program today. Join us again next week. Goodbye.